thing sent out, and we should be good. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. This is Chris Ingerson, and it is... I don't know why I keep saying January. July 24th. And this is the July 24th Tech Quest Death Stream. So, today we are going to be working on sewer combat again. Uh, specifically, we're going to be doing a bunch of animation and editor stuff today. Uh, about again. And uh, specifically, we're going to be doing a bunch. Did I not switch you back? I probably didn't. <laughs> Let's move that back then. Well, that sucks because that means that Unity is going to be all kinds of work. But uh, specifically, yeah, we're going to be doing a lot of animations, so a lot of timeline stuff, uh, a lot of editor tooling, um, probably some fancy editor scripting just to get things working all nice. Uh, and that's pretty much what we're going to be doing. So nothing particularly crazy or new, but uh, it's going to be, you know, pretty decent time. So, uh, f so first things first, the thing I'm currently working on is the, uh, the failure timeline for segment one. Uh, so let's actually show you what the current segment one looks like, uh, which is of course going to be awkward. I was look, I was working on this with, um, <laughs> With two screens yesterday, so I'm kind of getting back into one screen mode. Uh, so the idea is that for the first attack, you're going to come in here, you'll have the attack show up, uh, and then of course it'll pan to the next thing, depending on if you succeed or not. Uh, if you fail, uh, well, actually I guess I should show you what it's going to be if you su if you just do it. Um, the idea here is that you're going to have a pretty basic setup where uh, you'll have one option that's just kind of like attack the troll. Uh, and if you type that, then it'll succeed, go to the next thing. But if you fail that, then we're going to have a custom fail animation that happens, uh, which is just going to show the hero running forward, the troll moves to the side, the hero runs into the back bars there, and then falls over, rolls up, and then rolls back along the grating until they get back into their position. Uh, so that's what we're going to spend, that's what we're, we're going to be working on first. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can get through that at least but we'll see because i always think that i can get through stuff faster than i actually can uh anyway we're also going to be uh setting up a few timeline scripts for use in this just because there are some things that i need to do uh specifically i have i'm gonna have a kind of different approach to how i handle character animations in combat so before i was trying to just animate the characters with one model and just use that kind of as generically as possible across the um, across all of my combat scenarios, but I don't think that's actually going to be a, a, a feasible idea. So instead, what I'm going to try to do, uh, and I think this will work because it's kind of it's based off of a technique that some larger studios use for their animations uh, with characters, which is I'll actually enable and disable basically the exact same mesh, but duplicates of it um, that have different setups so that I can do certain things more easily. Uh, and specifically what I mean by that is our default troll here, or not our default troll, ah, default troll, default player here. If we look at them, you know, it's H-E-R-O, that's hero, of course. If we play one of its animations, here. Uh, for example, here's our idle animation. You know, it's pretty pretty basic. Uh, it's just a little bit of a up and down motion to make it look like they're breathing. Uh, if we stop that, let's go to still. Still is basically a single frame thing that does nothing. It's just meant to be a default state that we can transition from easily. Um, but the idea here is that if we want to do more advanced things, then it's really hard to do with the way, uh, to do those things with the way that these letters are set up because they're free-floating underneath one parent, and that means that rotating them is terrible. Um, keeping them in position relative to one another is a really hard thing to do, so instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable and enable sort of similar meshes. And if I enable them both at the same time, you can see that there's no real difference there. They're lined up exactly the same, and that's by intention. Uh, so we can easily transition between them. So if I wanted to do, say, this, we have this nice animation, which is now much easier because uh, if we look at the hierarchy, you'll see that my letters are actually parented to one another. That way they can move in relation to one another as opposed to uh, be moved kind of freeform like the default poses. is. 
So this has a couple of benefits. One is this type of rolling animation is a lot easier to perform, uh, just because it means that I don't have to um, move and rotate objects. I can actually just rotate them. Uh, but it also means that I can give their parent an offset. So you'll notice that our parent for troll roll, uh, which is going to be fun to say over and over again, I'm sure, is actually slightly behind the O. It's not at the root of the O, it's actually slightly behind it. And the idea there is that we want it to be in the center of this, uh, this circle once it rolls up. So if we change this from our roll up function to just our roll, uh, we can simply hit play and you'll see that we have this nice, easy to use rolling animation, uh, which apparently had weird lag. But Basically, by adopting this approach to our animations, we have a lot more flexibility when it comes to creating new animations for each individual scene. Um, because I tried really hard, really hard, to just use the default layout so that I wouldn't have to do anything too crazy. But whew, it is hard, let me tell you. It is just... There's, God, it... it Trying to get things rotated and positioned at the same time to make it look like they're all still connected, even though they're separate objects, is just really hard to do. So, <laughs> hello, Garrett. Welcome back. That probably is a weird animation to see out of context. But, uh, it's just a rolling animation. What, you don't roll up and roll around all the time? Come on, man. Get with the times. It's 2018. That's what all the kids are doing. Uh, but the other reason that I obviously wanted to do this is because it lets me do things like uh, more smooth motion across uh, things like this unfolding animation. You can see that it's they're moving in relation to one another, and it actually looks like they're one thing, as opposed to kind of this weird disjointed four separate things that are uh, just kind of moving in tandem. So let's go ahead and move back here and check preview. Why didn't I make you two seconds long? One two seconds long. Oh, let's roll. Uh, I want roll up. Hmm. I did make that two seconds, but I feel like troll and roll could probably be less than that. I'm actually gonna move these real quick. And come on. Okay, so that's the neutral unroll motion, or not. It's called Troll Unroll, but it's the hero. Uh, I'm trying to name them sensibly too, so that I don't uh, I don't get confused about which combat scenario they're supposed to be used in. Uh, but yeah, that's the current approach that I'm taking for animation. So we're going to be working within the system, um, setting it up, or setting up support for this system within timeline, so that it's a lot easier to switch between the models, uh, and basically just kind of getting all of the animation stuff figured out. So let's go ahead. Turn this off, turn you on, turn you off. Okay, so this is our default state. Everything's pretty straightforward from there. So I'm going to start by, I want to say set animation state. So I have a script called Combat Animation State Manager, which is not a great name. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it works. Uh, and the idea is, actually, I don't know if it works. I haven't tested it, but the name works. Uh, so the idea here is that we'll say, We'll call a function specifically. Uh, we will call change state, give it an index, and then we will uh, have a list of these uh, associations with a root object, which will be enabled, a, uh, a hand position parent, which is the object that the uh, transforms for the hand equipped items will be parented to. That way I can sw switch between the models without just suddenly having your weapons and equipment disappear. Uh, and then a head position, which would be for things like hats. Uh, and then we will basically select the... The ideal situation would be that I would just have a script in timeline that says, like, set combat animation state, and it would give me a drop-down representation with all of these IDs that I can select from. So let's go ahead, and we're going to say set... Oh, hold on, let me think. So I called it combat animation state manager. So I guess I could say set combat animation state... Create playables, playable behavior. I'm just going to say set combat animation state. No! Dang it! 
freaking, why do you do this? Sometimes, for some reason, the first letter just doesn't seem to get capitalized. Drives me nuts. I really hope you actually serialize that, Unity. There are always hats. Although I probably should have more in there. Right now I think I only have two. And technically only one of them is a hat, the other is a mask. Let's see. So we're going to let that go. Let's go ahead and create a new... I always have trouble finding this for some reason. Little asset. Set combat. Nation state. Both of these up. All right, so we're going to make this not dot common dot text quest dot timeline. Oh, actually, hold on. Sorry, dot combat. Uh, let's go ahead and copy that. Come back over here. Let's go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. Fix that real quick. Copy you. And we're just going to fill. Oh yeah, I don't know if I asked, how are you doing tonight, Garrett? Sorry. I was kind of fixated on my rotating, crunched-up hero. Ah. Hmm. Let's go ahead. And what are we going to need for this? So we're going to need an exposed reference to the actual... Um, Combat Animation State Manager. Yep. Such a great name. Uh, we'll say State Manager. Okay. This is where it's going to get fun. We're going to serialize field private int state index is equal to zero. And we're actually going to have to write a custom editor script to draw this properly. Uh, that's going to be fun. I will explain why once we start doing that. And I think, honestly, that's all I'm really going to need. So let's go ahead and copy this. Come back down here. A little bit of serialized field stuff. Make this just a regular reference. Make these public. Okay, and we don't care about on graph start and stop. We pretty much only care about behavior play. I'm just going to say if dot is playing doing well did I mention I'm working on manifold garden now you did not did you uh, apply for the programming position then well be careful it seems like that project burns out programmers just because I feel like he's gone through what half a dozen by now Well, congrats. It's exciting. What do you have you uh, working on to start, assuming that you can tell me? I don't, I don't know if you would have an NDA or not. I assume he would. But, mm. Okay, let's go ahead and we're just going to say state manager dot... What is it? Uh, da, 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 da. Change, change state, that's what it change state based on state index. Doing UI right now, then audio and general bug fixes. Okay. Seems about right for getting you onboarded, I suppose. Ah, uh, yeah. I've been meaning to actually look into FMOD. I really need to just do a huge audio integration pass, honestly. I've kind of pushed that off because I <laughs> really... Uh, I know my game really would benefit from it, I just haven't dove into it. Uh, I really should, though. Okay, so we're looking at calling change state, which actually, before I do anything else, I do need to say... Uh, we're going to say... Come down here, and we're going to have a private int... Uh, 
uh, not index, active index so is equal to zero. And then down here, I'm going to go ahead and just say private void start. Do I actually need to have a start there? I could probably just have a default to zero. That's the reasonable thing to do for default states. Um, so we're just going to assume that the first state is always your, is always the zero indexed state. So we're just going to say, uh, what do I want to do here? It's going to be states of active index dot root dot set active false. And that's pretty much all we need to do. So we're just going to say active index is equal to index after that. Cool, so that should take care of turning off our current animation state root and then change all of our, uh, or update all of our state roots to be the current index, basically. Uh, we're gonna come down here, don't need to do anything else there. Cool, so I think we're pretty much at the point where dot state manager is equal to state manager dot resolve graph dot get resolver. And then we're going to say behavior dot state index is equal to state index. Oh yeah, and uh, for those who are working with editor scripting and using um, exposed references, I figured out today finally how to actually assign references to exposed references in code. It's taken me forever to to figure out how to do it, but um, little editor diatribe here. It's kind of weird. Essentially what you have to do is call, uh, so I'm going to say state manager. So you call your exposed reference and actually, no, that's not, that's not correct. It's actually, you call graph.getResolver. So you have to get an I resolver or I exposed property table. And then you say dot set reference value. Then you take your exposed reference. So in my case, state manager, then dot expose name, and then you give it an object. In this case, it would be whatever, encode game object or object derived class you can think of. But like, that's such an esoteric way of setting, uh, that, of setting a value. It's just nonsensical. Why is that the way it's set up? Uh, it is a playable thing and that's probably why it's so weird because they have to do all the resolving at runtime. Uh, but it's just, geez, you'd think that they would have I don't know, an editor function to do it. So, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that, for those who are curious, that's essentially what you have to call. Um, I'll probably post that actually in the Discord after this if someone reminds me. Um, I can write up like a little example. But that's been bugging me for like a couple of weeks now, at least. Uh, probably actually a little bit longer because I've tried to do stuff with assigning exposed references at runtime before. Oh, not at runtime, but uh, as an editor tool before. And it's just, it was super weird. So I, I finally figured it out. <laughs> Unnecessarily convoluted. Okay, so let that compile. Uh, we'll close these scripts because they're gonna complain about friggin' different line endings. Because why wouldn't they? Okay, we'll save both of these. Close them again. Come back here. And now I get to do the fun editor stuff. So let's see. I... Hmm. Actually, now that I think about it, do any of these have custom editors? I think they do because this isn't set up. Oh no, here it is. I do have an editor folder. But I think this is technically outside of my combat, or outside of my... Is it though? I don't know, I have a custom editor here, so... Alright, so I'm going to create a folder. And we'll say timeline, create a folder, call that characters. I hate having to use this structure. Create folder, combat animation state. I really should write an editor tool that will just like copy the folders. Well, I guess I wouldn't know exactly how far down to copy. Because it would be nice to have some sort of editor tool, editor tool where I could just like right click, copy folder path or something, and then right click and say paste folder path, and that would just make folders below it. Uh, just because I don't like constantly have to make folders nested, just for my own sanity. Okay, so there's going to be set, oops, set, co 
combat animation state clip editor. Good God, these names are getting long. Okay, so this is going to be using Unity Engine. I'm sorry, using Unity Editor. Unity Editor. That's going to be a custom editor type of set combat animation clip editor. This is going to be text quest combat. Okay, good. And the next thing I want to do. Just gonna say override on inspector GUI, and I guess I'm gonna want an override on enable. Or not override, so I'm just gonna be private. Void on enable. We're gonna need a few serialized properties. Private serialized property. I think it's. Manager, serialized property, M something because apparently I can't remember my own thing. State index. Okay, and then we're just gonna say M state manager is equal to serialized object dot find property blah blah blah. Uh, let's go ahead and just copy that paste. Okay. So instead of doing base dot on inspector GUI, which I probably don't need to do, um, we can simply say, uh, oh, I do actually want to, hold on, let's go ahead and save that real quick, just so that I can do it, F, and I need to fix that. This my cap. Save. Close this. Uh, we're also going to go down to timeline and grab our combat playable track. Apparently, it also had line it, line differences. Uh, we're going to say track clip type type of type og type of uh, set combat animation state clip. Cool. Doing this just so that we can get a uh, visual. Inspector on this. So we'll let that compile, and then I'm going to take a drink. Hmm. I'm trying to think if there's anything else really cool that I've done with Unity in the past couple of not really. Uh, I've been kind of strapped down at work, so I haven't really been able to experiment with any tooling, which always makes me sad. I usually like to try to figure out weird convoluted things at work. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to select segment 01 failure, pull up our timeline. Uh, let's go ahead and collapse this, collapse this. I suppose we are actually going to want to add combat playable track let's go ahead and say set combat animation state clip all right so this is what it currently looks like we have our exposed reference and we have our index field now i want this index to be actually displayed as a uh, as a drop down not as an not not as a regular int field so we're actually going to come down to here not there cuz we don't care about you uh, and we're going to just say oh and actually that was the So, of course, I have to draw the script field, which means I'm going to have to say custom. Hmm. You know what? I, hmm. No, that wouldn't work. Would it? No, it's probably not going to work out here. I'm going to say using sleepy common custom editor utility. Okay. Oh, right. Not common. Common editor. Uh, so we're going to say uh, custom editor utility dot 
draw script field, serialized object. It's all good. Okay, and then we're going to say serialized object dot update. At the very bottom, serialized object dot apply modified properties. Okay. And in between that, we're going to do our basic editor edit toy layout dot property field and state manager. Okay, now here's where things get fun. Uh, I need to, I can't use just editor GUI layout property field because that would obviously, again, draw the regular state field or the regular field, but we don't want to do that. So instead, I have to do a little bit of a convoluted thing. Uh, first up, we're going to say if uh, m state manager dot get object reference, um, or actually, hold on, object reference ID, that's what I want. Uh, is equal to zero, or sorry, does not equal zero. So if it has a, it has some kind of object reference, then we want to do something. In which case, we're going to say um, m state manager dot get object reference. And this is going to be uh, combat animation state manager. Okay, we're going to grab that, paste this state manager is equal to that. Okay, so that gets the reference to our actual combat state manager. Then from there, we can build up our list of uh, values to show. So we're going to just say string names is equal to new string state manager. Ooh, that didn't go well. State manager dot. You're probably actually. But aren't you? Yep. Because of course you are. Boy. Uh, fine. Come down here. Public combat state states get return states or stats states. Okay, pretty easy there. Dot states length pretty easy then we're just going to say for int i equal to zero i is less than names dot length i plus plus names of i is equal to state manager dot states of i dot id k and now we are just going to say uh, how do i want to handle Yes, I could. Nah, it's fine. Um, so let's go ahead and. No, I do want it to. Yes, that should be fine. Okay. Uh, so we're just going to say. Mm, nope, 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 nope. Hold on. I'm going to do a safety check, and all I'm going to do is say if uh, m state index dot int value is greater than or equal to names dot length. If that's the case, then likely what happened is we changed ah, I got the hiccups. Uh, we changed our state manager reference. Um, so we want to just go ahead and wipe that value. We're just going to reset it to zero. So we're going to say m state index dot int value is equal to zero. Okay, pretty straightforward. And that also helps prevent, you know, index out of range exceptions. And then all we're going to do is just say, uh, oh, geez, do I have to do that? No, I think I can get away with it. So I'm going to say m state index dot int value is equal to editor GUI layout dot pop up, and then we will have. Uh, we want the label, which is going to be, of course, inaccessible. M state index dot display name. Let's see, I think it's yeah, it's going to complain, aren't you? Uh, of course you are. So new GUI content. M state index dot display name. We're just going to leave it like that. Uh, followed by my displayed options, which is just going to be names, followed by the actual selected in 
index. Assuming I can do this, are you going to let me? Oh, good. Fine. Whatever. We'll just do that then. Yeah, there's some weird uh, gap or oversight in the enum.popup stuff where you can use a string label and string names for the for the dropdown values, but you can't use a GUI content label and string values for that. I don't know why they did it that way. I'm assuming it's because they were lazy. But for that, we're just going to say m state index dot int value. Okay, so that should make it functional. So now, if we let this compile. This should change to a dropdown, and it should... Actually, no, it'll, it'll go away entirely because we don't have our, in, our reference set up yet. Which is fair. <laughs> One day it'll compile. Eventually. There. Uh, let's go ahead and drag you in. Boom! Nice. And if we go into debug mode, you can see nothing because it doesn't actually show us that stuff I forgot. I always forget that, right? Yeah, because it's nowhere around here. Never mind. So we can't actually confirm that that's the case, but it should be the case. Um, so I can select from a dropdown of names rather than just randomly typing in an integer that I have to remember off the top of my head. Cool. So we're going to want this to be troll roll at some point, which I believe is probably going to be about here. 60. Uh -huh. And we can make this last for like one second because we don't really care about it. Okay. So that should allow us to actually set up our uh, state transitions fairly easily. Uh, next, we are going to need to set up our actual failure. Oh, and I really should have rigged up a uh, test start combat script before the uh, stream today. We'll just use our existing one. All right. So for this, I want to come down here to my offense section clip. Uh, we're going to assign our failure timeline right there. And I wonder, oh, geez, I could try. No, I'm not going to try. I was going to try to set up some sort of preview setup for timeline so I could just scrub through, a, through our failure timeline without having to play, but oh, the amount of effort that would take. Jeez, I really, really wish that it was easier to undo timeline clip stuff in the editor because it's it's tedious to set all that up. You have to basically cache all of the values when the graph starts and then reset them when the graph stops. And uh, that just causes all kinds of problems. Okay, so let's go ahead and select you, which of course you're not gonna do anything because why would you ever? Let's grab our attacks. We want our combat attack label. Uh, da -da -da, complete and fade, that's all good. Fade and duration, we need our target. Follow target, all static. Just say I'll follow. Fail priority of zero because there's only going to be one. So all of these things are correct. Whew. So let's go ahead and add one action, which is just going to be like attack troll. No, no, no period. No punctuation. Uh, we're not going to worry about success or failure stuff yet. Well, no, we already have failure set up. But we're not going to worry about success timelines yet. Uh, although technically, I guess I could reference it because it's there. Uh, we don't have a hazard timeline because one doesn't exist there. Our spawn point is, of course, the next thing. Our target is, as always, the main camera. And let's see, we want to... We do want it to follow the target, I guess. It's not really going to move, but yeah, we'll have it. And we want to parent to spawn. That doesn't really matter, honestly. Okay. So let's go ahead and set up. We need our spawn point. I'm going to take a stab in the dark, and I'm just going to say probably somewhere. Da, 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 da. Let's come up to here. Uh, let's go ahead, and we're just going to call this uh, tax spawn point. OK. 
Okay. Probably somewhere stupid. Move you over to here. No. Nope. Yep, we're gonna do that. Yep. Why are you moving in, in chunks of two? Why aren't you moving in chunks of one? There we go. Not much better though. Negative point seven five. Oh, point five. Yeah, negative point five. That's good. Let's go one up. And I'm probably going to guess that 1.5, really? Uh, yeah, 1.5 seems right. Um, it's a little close. How about... Okay, I think that's good. Let's go ahead and set that up real quick. is fine. Uh, let's go ahead and set the cameras down. Come down here. Uh, we're going to use our attack spawn point. Okay, so now everything should be set up. So we should be able to actually spawn this, but we do need to set up uh, our actual combat to get to that point. Which probably means that I need to uh, take care of the actual setup phases. Oi. I should have done this last night. Uh, let's see, so we we go all the way to our actual, uh, we go through our intro scene, we have that set up, um, but I do need to actually get, actually, you know what, I guess this would be fine, I just need to set up um, our, a couple of things, so this is going to be our segment one, so that'll make that transition happen, oh, wait, I'm sorry, that's not quite right, but eh, that's fine, let's go back to here, segment one, here. Oh, that's right, they're not combat players. Uh, we can leave you alone for now. Failure cutscene I'm not too worried about. Equipment data, that I can pull in. And that is pretty much all we care about. So I'm probably, for the time... I can't do that. Now let's see, start combat test. Let's pull in our combat system. Enemy ID is sewer troll, defeated ID, or we don't care about any of this. Um, this is going to be our sewer combat. Combat music, we don't care about enemy name. It's just going to be uh, troll, I guess. Okay. And I think that will be fine for us to test. Let's go ahead and just hit play to see what happens. I don't remember if I have to be in a separate scene for that. Hello, Jill Mega. Welcome back. How are you doing tonight? And I guess by extension, how's your engine doing tonight? Oh, good. No references. What do you need? Ah, you need the combat player. Fair enough. Well, let's do that real quick then. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, this so this is one of the fun things that I realized after I uh, after I adopted the um, the new animation approach. I am going to have to drag in all of my labels, all of them, <laughs> which is oh god, it's gonna be so crazy to do that. There there could literally be dozens of those letters that have to be set on the player uh, whenever combat starts. And I mean, that's not terrible, I guess, but it's it's tedious, to be sure. So let's go ahead real quick. We're just going to lock that. I'm just going to grab all of you, pull you in, and then we'll also go ahead and grab you. Okay, so those are our labels. Uh, Equip point, right equip point, and left equip point. Okay, so that should now work. Let's go ahead and go back up to our combat. Oh, right, I forgot. I locked it. Drag our hero into there. And then we should be fine. So let's go ahead and try this out.
Working on some RTTI stuff. Wanted to work on ECS, but don't really want what the components need to derive from component. Plus, had some issues with cross DLL handling the components, so RTTI it is. Okay. I'm trying to think RTTI. Off the top of my head, I can't think of what that is. Uh, anyway, so we're going to go ahead and go into battle. We should get our combat transition. Oh, pfft, I forgot that they still have the... Ah, okay. Well, we're just going to let that go. Which I'm sure is going to cause all kinds of problems. Oh, oh dear. What happened? Where'd it go? And our hero has been lost to the ages. What the heck happened? Okay. Uh, oh, you know what it is? I bet I forgot to... Uh, <laughs> oh my god, I did, didn't I? Yup. Totally forgot to actually enable the uh, new index. Of course I did. So make that true. Runtime type information. Ah, okay. She was using templates to make sure each component has its own ID, but template stuff can be an issue for when this is, or for this one having cross DLL stuff. Ah, okay. Makes sense. Let's go ahead and let that compile again. Uh, so, the. Oh, shoot. You know what? Actually, before we play that again, I am going to adjust our segment zero one timeline so the character animation right now is pretty simple it's basically just the character running towards the bars and then smacking into them uh, but I need to make sure that its rotation is correct so oh right that uh, let's see if I can get that to work so we're gonna just Set our hero model, I want to say. It's probably the thing that we want. Um, I'm just going to timeline here. We're going to set our rotation y to be 1, and then set our rotation y to be 0. And just make sure that it's you know facing the right direction when we actually play. And real quick, we can collapse that. Let's go ahead and add a new combat playable track. Uh, so this is going to be set combat state, and this is going to be set animation param, uh, which now that I think about it is, I believe, actually a playable track script. Oh, right, it doesn't exist. Um, well, let's see if I can do this here. Comment message, comment animation state. Yep, okay, so it has to go see how the next quest set animator parameter track that's what I want so we're gonna drag the animation over here then I can say that to do it over there and we're gonna do pretty much the same thing so right about here we're gonna set the animation value to be uh, oh you know what I should do is I should redo this so that it's not terrible oh look at that it's also terrible because I can't click on the label Ugh. Quite annoying when it's 30 degrees Celsius in my room. Yeah, 30 degrees is not very fun. Well, in either Fahrenheit or uh, metric or Celsius. Uh, yeah, it's about it's a little under 80 in my house too. So I, I feel your pain. Okay, so for now I guess we can just use our default ID, which is going to be, I think it's is... Bowling is going to be the thing, and that's going to be bool. Setting it to true. I'm like 90% sure that's actually what that is. So probably what I want to do is grab this, grab you, come down to animator. And yes, it is rolling. 
Oh, and actually, a uh, couple of things that I want to do here. I need to change these guys. Let me make transitions to here. Make transitions to here. No. Okay, I've never had something make a transition to itself. I didn't know you could do that. Huh. Apparently, you can make transitions to yourself. Or to the same state in uh, Mechanim. I was not aware of that. I guess it kind of makes sense that that's a thing, but... 80 degrees is warm. <laughs> so, let's see. 80 degrees would be swimming. I mean, that's 70 degrees is swimming weather. Um, 80 degrees is actually, I believe, pretty close to 30 degrees Celsius. I think. It's been a while. I'm not, I'm not up on my conversion between those two. Um, okay, so for this, we want it to transition... Uh, If is rolling is true, does not have exit time. And here we're going to say if is rolling is false, we're going to transition it back. And we will transition it back to exit time. Okay, good. So let's go ahead, select our segment one failure again, uh, because I have several things that I want to do. Oh, wait, wasn't there a thing I could? just insert okay so i'm going to add a set parameter clip we're going to put it to like right here uh, adjust d to be the start at like oh come off of it i'm 40. is that too much to ask really uh we're going to set this it is going to be is attacking okay this is going to be our bool that is going to be true so now we should have a pretty good uh, we should have a, a pretty good state transition set up. So now the player character should be facing the right way. They should move forward. They should stop animating when they hit the wall, and they should roll up when they uh, hit the or when they I guess when we tell them to. And then from there we can start animating them rolling back. And obviously we're going to have to animate the troll because right now the troll doesn't actually move. Um, the idea is that the troll is just going to do like a basic sidestep while tilting its T to follow you. And 30C is about, is 86? Okay. I knew they were close, but I didn't expect it to be exact. So let's go ahead and we're going to just test this real quick. So turn off preview. Come back here. Hit OK. Okay, so there are our character movements. Everything's in here. I'm not crazy about how the. I really wish I. Oh, well, hmm. I might set it up so that the health comes in right away. Oh, you know what? I'm stupid. I always forget that I set this up. I hope I set it up, otherwise I'm going to look really, really stupid. Uh, let's go up here to intro, and then mute you. I'm pretty sure that actually our combat system handles that for us. So let's go ahead and just try that. <laughs> ah, I got your nose against your monitor, I see. It smells like pixels. And text. There we go, that's much better. So we're going to do one. We're going to let it fail, and then after this I am going to get rid of the rotation. I still just hear the... <sighs> Freaking Unity! <sighs> Anyone want to guess what happened? I'll give you a hint. Timeline broke again. So I'm going to have to... Uh and then resume. So now we're going to have our hero run up. What the f... Oh, good, you overshot. Of course. Oh, and apparently that's set to loop. So, okay. Going well so far. Going real well. So, real quick, let's come up here. 
here. Use this, close you, because I don't need all of you open. Alright, I'm gonna remove you, Nine Man. Uh, where are you? Right here. Uh, so troll roll up is not going to loop, neither will troll unroll. Those are just one time things. Only troll roll is meant to be looped. He is. He is cool. Oh, by the way, welcome back, cool. How are you doing tonight? Okay, so let's go ahead, grab our second one failure, come up here, do this. I'm assuming that it overshoots because I don't have keys? Maybe. Um, I'm a little concerned, actually, because the hero's rotation value, since it's now set, is going to be a problem later on especially because I don't know how to get rid of those keyframes without just, I guess I could just highlight them. Um, because after the tr after the hero rotates and uh, curls up into a ball and starts rolling backwards, uh, I am probably going to eventually have, ah, you know what, I guess I could manually do it. We'll see when we get there. It's going to be a bit of a like crazy pop animation. So Tired? Tried using bound checking for my paint splatter issue, but struggling to get the collider of the second game object to place the paint on it. Yeah, banging your head against the keyboard to get stuff to work can be pretty frustrating sometimes. So I'm going to go ahead, let's preview this. So you can see that we start running, although actually, you know what, I, I did this wrong, now that I think about it. Um, so for those who have not read it, um, there are, what is it, the 12 animations, or the 12 principles of animation, uh, and one of those is that normally you never want to have an object just start moving and then stop moving suddenly, because that looks mechanical, but the there are exceptions to that rule, or to those rules, and one of those exceptions is when the object is coming in off screen, it does not need to accelerate, because it's off screen, you can't see it. So it's just implied that it did that acceleration and then it can come in at full speed. Um, currently, with the setup for the cutscene, it kind of takes a little bit for it to, to pick up and actually get to where it needs to go. So probably what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to set this to be a little sharper. Actually, you know what? I wonder if I can just straight up have the right tangent view on here. Yeah, that works better. So that'll just have it start running out a little bit faster. I don't want you to overshoot, though, which is annoying. Um, so I actually want this to have my right tangent be a constant, I think. So we want this to go like... The idea being that you're you know, running into a bar, so you're going to come to a sudden stop. Um, so what are you... How are you trying to get the collider of the second game object I'm assuming that you are, by second object, you mean the first object is the bullet, or the blob of paint that's hitting? Okay, so we're going to go here, and then we get our rotation. So that should look a little bit better now. Um, but while we're in here, let's go ahead and animate our troll. Because, you know, why not? Uh, let's say add animation track. Uh, we do need to open up our troll parent. Although our hero parent actually needs that too. So miscellaneous animator. Uh, again, if you are working at, with anything in timeline, I always recommend having empty game object parents for an object that you're animating, uh, just because it's better to move the parent of a game object in timeline than it is to move the object directly in case you want to do something like vibration or have it kind of just do something a little independent of the animation, but still go along with the pathing. Uh, it's just much easier to have an empty parent that the actual positioning while the child main object can do whatever it wants. So we're going to go back here to our segment one failure. We're going to drag in our troll parent. Okay. And all we're going to need to do is hit record. Let's go ahead and come down here. Uh, we will have a position and then you and then you. And then we're just going to go to about here. So probably at about 60, we'll have it be kept in the same position until, let's see, the 
Kira runs into it right about here. So let's have it move out of the way by my or by frame 180. So I'm actually going to have this. Oops, where are you? I'm actually going to have this rotate over or move over to the left a little bit. Okay. And then if we go back to timeline, you'll see that we will get this effect. It just moves over to the side. That. All right. Nice. Okay, so then we're going to get two distinct things that we need to do. The actual trolls animation isn't really going to change much. Basically, we just want it to um, we just want it to move to the side. And the only real special thing that I need to do is I need to rotate its T so that it looks like it's uh, looking at the hero. So I think. We can actually set that up uh, with timeline scripting, so I don't need to do anything extra here. Instead, what I can do is I can add a timeline comma playable track. Uh, we're going to say look at target because that's all I want it to do. Uh, it is going to be our troll parent, and it's going to look at the hero parent. Uh, it is always going to follow. The axes is going to are going just going to be y. And let's see. Uh, probably it's going to go to the very end, obviously. Uh, no, by second game object, I mean when the paint splatter splashes onto a second object if shot close to a floor wall. Oh, like uh, collateral damage, kind of. I was using the on collision enter function with the collider of the paint splatter, but it only registers on the floor, not the wall. Not sure if it's because the wall is static. Seems fine. Uh, I know that for detecting collisions, you do have to be careful because there has to be at least one non-static or non-kinematic uh, rigid body, I believe, for it to detect collisions. Is that right? I think that's right. Um, but you also might look into using on trigger enter for your splatter effect just because potentially you might not want it to be a collider. You might want it to be a trigger instead. Okay, so if we play this, it should now move out of the way and rotate to look at them, but the head won't move, uh, which means that the, the next thing we need to do is a little more difficult. I might be able to get away with it. Maybe, we'll see. Because I know that I don't really have the axes working here yet, but I'm going to try it. So let's go ahead and we're going to add another combat playable track. We're pretty much going to do the same thing. We're going to add a look at clip. Drag this over. Uh, it is going to be everything. It is always going to follow, and it's going to be the T on the troll this time. But it will still be looking at the hero parent. Okay. So I think, actually, you know what? No, it's not going to be everything. It's going to be X only. But I don't think X actually works. So let's go ahead and let that play out, see what it looks like. Okay, so let's try this. Yeah, I tried to trigger two, but couldn't get it to register the wall either. Yeah, the trigger one is the one, or is the stuff that can be kind of weird because you need at least one non static or non kinematic rigid body attached to one of the triggers, uh, and it can be weird. Not that. Okay, so that's us. Let's go ahead. Dang it, I forgot to get rid of the rotation. One of these days, I swear, I'm just going to start playing the You Spin Me Right Round of, uh, song because, seriously, it's. Oh god! <laughs> Perfect! <laughs> oh god! Turned into a propeller head. <laughs> Jesus. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I think I'm switching my game. I'm just going to call it Text Quest, The Exorcist Edition. Good God, that was terrifying. Okay, 
Yeah, the uh, the X rotation does not really work, so I can probably change that real quick. Because um, I think right, I think I got lazy and I only did the Y rotation. Uh, let's go ahead and do look at target behavior. Go to definition. Let's fix it so that we actually do uh, X. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. So we want to do. Ugh, I don't want to handle this. Um, I guess it would pretty much be something like this. Except it's going to be Y instead of X. Uh, let's see. Invert. And I think this tells me upwards, which is still what I want. But I would just want to zero out the Y and the Z. Is that really all I need to do? Hmm. Well, let's try it. I get a feeling it's not going to be that easy, but we'll, we'll see. Oh, the Texorcist! Okay. Yeah, you win tonight, Garrett. That's good. <laughs> ah, dang it! Now I want to make like a fake movie poster. <laughs> jeez. Ah, <laughs> oh, jeez. No, I should not sink that much effort into it. Ah, <laughs> uh, that was that was amazing though. That worked out very well. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we have this. I feel like I should shorten this uh, duration. I don't really like how long it kind of sits there. Uh, let's go to one. I keep forgetting. Good God. Okay, I'm going to select it so that I don't forget. It almost worked. Why is it rotating around the z-axis? It's like looking the wrong way too, which makes me think I need to invert it, which is fine, I guess. So let's go ahead and say invert. See if we get something useful out of that. Also, I... Oh, no, okay, hold on. A couple of things. I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to stop. I'm going to come back here. Kind of remove our letter rotation behavior, uh, and then I'm going to set this to maximize on play. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> I do like that that panning path though, although I, I need to have the uh, look target be a little farther to the right initially, or maybe do like a little zigzag. Okay, come over here, attack the troll, which I might actually not have it face the camera, just because it's not at such an angle that I don't think you could type it and it will look better if it's flush. What the frig? It's like it's still rotating in the Y. Oh, and also I just noticed that our um, our body was totally not rotating, which is awesome. Uh, let's go back here and see if there's any failure. Timeline. Can I not? So troll parent, are you rotating? Or is something preventing you from doing so? I didn't. I didn't think there was. I'm not. I don't have any rotation data on it, so it shouldn't be doing that. Uh, okay, we're going to turn off Maximize on Play, and then I'm going to just keep a keep an eye on this and see if it even does rotate, because it totally should. Okay. Hmm. Let's go to 
battle. I also need to set up our uh, hint and such at the bottom so that we have a good timing on it. Oh yeah, and I was also thinking this through. I'm not sure if I can really use a single timer now that I think about it. Ah, freaking Unity. You are not rotating. Select our timeline. It's targeting it. But it's... Am I not moving the hero's parent? Is that what the problem is? Nope. I'm moving that. Okay. Why aren't you rotating then? Hmm. Wonder, I wonder, I wonder, because it should basically like this should pretty much be rotating at this point. Um, I'm gonna try forcing it. Okay, so something forces it back. It that's it thinks that's where it's supposed to be rotating, I guess, but it's completely wrong. Interesting. Okay then. Check this out. Uh, let's see. Timeline. Always follow Y, troll parent, target. That's all correct. I wonder. <sighs> oh. Yeah, that could be it. It's entirely possible. <sighs> okay, fine. Uh, I'm going to save and I'm going to close and reopen Unity because it's just messing up. And that usually is because Timeline borked itself somehow, and so it's not going to ever work again until I close Unity, because, you know, Chris can't have nice things. I guess I shouldn't say that, because the text assist is, exists today, so, you know, apparently I can't have nice things. Just very rarely, and never when I'm, you know, never in my actual work. Hmm. I am curious as to why. Does that make sense? Uh, hint on. Nah. Fortunately, it shouldn't re import everything. So. Wow. C sharp can't execute some code and fall into the next case in a switch, but can go to case. Yeah, it's. It's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> oh no, we do have changes. Uh, stop that Unity. <sighs> this is one of the things that I hate about Unity from time to time, is that whenever you open it, it seems like there's a 50-50 chance that for no real reason it will just do that checking for changes thing. Um, actually, I think what that is, is collaborate. And it's even more galling because it still doesn't have all of my changes. If I pull a fresh version of this project onto a, a new device, it's missing scripts. And I just... <clears throat> I don't know how to fix that. It's very annoying. I could probably try re-importing the entire project one day. That would suck, but I could probably do it. Oh good, we have to compile. Boy. Oh good, we have to compile this now too. So we're kind of all over the place on compilations. Let's try this again one more time and see if things actually rotate the way they should. It's weird, though, because I think the troll and the hero were rotating to face the camera, now that I think about it. So you can see them rotating here just fine. Okay. Well, at least it isn't JavaScript. Oh, God. What even is that? Are you just like concatting arrays? Or is that like one big array of concatenated arrays? Good God, man. Uh, let's go ahead and say battle. We're just going to let that go. But yeah, JavaScript is really really frustrating to work with. I will not deny that. What the frick? 
Why? For what reason? Whatever. I'm going to try something different then. I'm going to just say, um, let's open you up. Uh, timelines, phase one. I'm doing this so that I can turn off follow target. I don't want to do that. Uh, but for failure, I'm going to change our target here for the look at clip from the troll parent to the troll itself. And let's just see if that works. God, that's just so crazy. Ah, too many arrays. And arrays of arrays of arrays. Alright, we're going to do battle. I'm going to let that run out. Oh, interesting. It's still facing the camera. Move, and there. Like, that's better question mark so the the t the x rotation on the t is clearly still all kinds of messed up um which is not really what i want to do here ah hmm. that i suppose could be the problem uh, i don't really want to do it but all i really want the t to do is just rotate on the x-axis i don't really want it to like tilt or pitch or anything like that i, I just want it to rotate on the x so i i could keyframe it myself um, i just didn't want to really do that but eh. mostly because i wanted to just have this automatically handle it for me but because this is using global rotation not local rotation it's not feasible. It's going to do all kinds of weird stuff. So let's go ahead and we're just going to jump over to segment one failure. I go to our timeline. Uh, I am going to I'm going to move this off to the side so you guys won't be able to see this, but uh, it'll let us actually get a view of both the scene view and the game view, and I will need both. Um, oh god, rejects. Rejects is like the bane of my existence when it comes to. Uh, data formatting it's it's i don't know the format for rejex functions are is just so weird to me uh, i'm sure i mean it, it it must make sense it's just that i haven't really had to deal with it extensively so whenever i see it i'm like ah looks hideous okay uh anyway i'm going to go ahead and we will keep this but i don't need this rotation anymore so we're going to this and we're just going to say rotate control mm -hmm. okay and then we're going to go ahead and how do I want to handle this I guess it would be in I guess it's just an animation thing so we're going to I have to animate the T. Let's see, this is frame 60. Okay. Uh, I'm going to grab my troll, grab the model, grab the T. Okay. And I'm just going to rotate it on the x axis. I'm going to set that to 1, and then I'm going to zero it out because I actually want it to remain at 0. Uh, let's go, wrong thing. So we're going to come down here. I will do the same thing. One, zero. We're going to come over to here. Right about... Right about there is where we want it to be looking pretty much all the way down. Okay. And at that point, it's probably going to be something like 45, negative 45... <laughs> That seems about right. And then about here. So 
So when it slams into the door, or into the wall, I'm guessing we want this to be more like negative 20. Like just a slight tilt. Actually, you know what? By then we probably want it to be zero again. Uh, so I can get this nice little like, kind of like dip animation going on. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and stop recording. I just want to see that in action. Turn off preview, I'm going to hit save, and we're just going to fire this off. Probably could have maximized on play there, but eh, whatever. Basically, slits code when the following characters are encountered. A space, or I'm assuming that's just white space. Um, a new tab, or a tab, and braces. Angle brackets. Is that a comma, I'm assuming? Hmm. That is quite a bit, though. Okay, so we're going to back. Oh, why are you rotated? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be facing the camera. Oh, it's because I have them all set to do that. I need to disable that check. Oh. Uh... I hmm a couple of things. One, I'm going to uncheck. Where are you? There you are. All static. And then let's go ahead and play again. I'm not it looks wrong. Or at least in my opinion the head looks wrong. It looks like it's bending backwards. I just didn't look at it right. Hmm. Okay, let's go into the combat again. Wah, wah. I gotta rotate that 180 degrees. <laughs> no, it's correct. It just looks wrong because it's a T. It's symmetrical, so I can't tell which direction it's bending. Ugh. It's a little awkward. I don't know what I can do about that, really. Maybe some Z-rotation would help with that, because it would make it offset at that point, but I, I really don't want to do that. Um. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and grab you. Uh, yawn. Flip you 180 degrees. Uh, let's go back to our failure timeline, and I'm going to move this back over here so you guys can see what I'm doing. Uh, and we are going to, oh boy, all of the animation. Uh, we're going to go back to our character animation. I'm going to pop this open. We will hit record, and I'm just going to have this move over to about here. So at 360, uh, we have it, uh, well, so at 240, which is four seconds, uh, the player hits the far wall. They will stay there for two seconds before they unroll. I'm sorry, not unroll, roll up. And then for about two seconds after that, is that right? I th no, the, uh, yes, the rolling is two seconds long, so I actually need to set that to, uh, let's see. Let's try to set you to true. Duration of two. And then we can go ahead and do this. So we're going to be stuck there for a bit. Uh, let's go ahead and come over here to 480. And so now I'm actually, I'm actually kind of at an impasse here because I need to plan for what happens if you die when you hit that wall. Uh, so... There are a couple of things that I actually want to do. First things first, I'm going to stop recording here so I can check some stuff. Uh, we're going to collapse the troll because we don't care about it right now. Collapse our cameras because we don't care about that right now. Collapse our hero. I'm going to go ahead and add a track group. We're going to call this combat system, I guess. Okay. Add a combat, adjust combat system track. We are going to 
add a set failure cutscene, uh, maybe? Because essentially what I want to do is, um, let's turn that off. So if you normally run into the wall over there during normal gameplay and you have health, uh, so let's say you have three health, you run into the wall. As soon as you hit the wall, you're going to lose one health. Then you'll roll up into the ball, roll back, and then jump into the air, unpop or pop out, and then land on your feet, and then you'll be facing the troll again. Uh, that's if you have health. If you lose all of your health when you run into the wall, what I want to do is instead of having you roll up into a ball, I just want you to like hit the wall and then fall back and be flat against the ground, and then we'll get the losing message. Uh, so. I probably shouldn't actually have my... I shouldn't really animate beyond running into the wall for this particular cutscene. Um, because if I do, then it, it would be tedious for me to actually figure out how to jump to another cutscene. So I'm going to actually get rid of this. Uh, let's see, camera. I need that to shrink back. Well, okay. So that means that we basically just have our regular. Uh, over here, let's add a combat rainbow track. Let's add the damage clip, which is going to happen here, pretty much exactly there, where the target is going to be the player. Our combat system is, of course, down here. And then we will have to figure out what happens if we if we die. Um, and that's actually where it gets kind of interesting now that I think about it. Let me go ahead and grab this clip. Um, and we're going to go to our behavior. Because I think what happens right now is that we just deal player damage, and then we check to see what the failure cutscene is. But I mm, that's not actually viable, because in this case, I need to deal damage, and then if that damage brings you down to zero, I need to override the uh, the target failure cutscene that plays. So hmm. I could probably add a field for that. So I'll say serialize field private exposed reference uh, playable director, and then we'll say override, or how about uh, death cutscene? So that's just a cutscene that can play if you run out of HP here. Hmm. Code to split text for tokenization, remove little comments. Took some time to format correctly on haste bin. Oof. I believe it. Nice. My man, using using new line braces. Although you do use uh, new line if statements if they're one line, which I don't do. <laughs> but it's okay. At least you use new line braces. Because same line braces drive me crazy. They're, they're ugly and they're not readable. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and I'm going to copy this. To deal damage behavior. Peek. Come out of here, paste that, and make it public. It's not going to be an exposed reference, it's just a playable director. Okay, let's go ahead and save that. We'll finish that code in a second, and then we're going to say behavior dot death cutscene is equal to death cutscene dot resolve graph dot get resolver. Hmm. Okay, come back here. And all we're going to do is say if combat system dot player HP is less than or equal to one. Um, that's uh, really awkward because um, I could potentially deal more. We'll just leave it like this for now, but that's probably something I might I'm gonna have to change later. 
Um, we're just going to say combat system dot set. Sorry, that in the uh, failure cutscene is equal to death cutscene. And actually, what I'm going to do there is I want to say um, if death cutscene does not equal null and that. Because I don't want to do that if it's uh, if I actually have no death cutscene specified there. Okay, so let's go ahead and let that compile. Uh, um, for now, I'm not going to worry about the actual death cutscene. I'm just going to move on to making the um, the next failure cut, the next part of the failure cutscene, which has to be its own separate cutscene um, for convenience purposes. So let's go ahead and create video playable director. I'm going to call this one. Segment 01 Failure B, I guess. Go ahead and right click, create timeline asset. Uh, I want to go to text quest, combat, control, timeline assets. Uh, let's see here. 01 Fail Cache B. Okay. And from there, I want to say uh, we're going to add our track group. We'll have our cameras. We're going to add another track group. We're going to add our characters. OK. And then let's see. Before I do anything else, oh god, I have. Hold on. That really makes things difficult. Because I... So if I don't die, then I need to be able to play an actual other cutscene. Uh, jeez. Okay, let me think, let me think, let me think. How do I want to handle that? Doesn't make sense. Hmm. Mm, let me think. So the problem is that uh, when I get to the end of this cutscene, I need to be able to go to one of two cutscenes. Uh, if I have more than one HP, so I won't die from the uh, from the attack mis mishap, uh, I should go into the default animation, which will be the, the hero rolling up, rolling back, and then popping up and landing on their feet. But if... Um, but if I do die, then I need to set the death cutscene that will play. Or, or I could, no. Yep, that won't work. I'm, oh, geez. I, yay, yay, yay. I might have to. Jeez. So the problem is that as soon as I deal damage, if I go down to zero health, it's going to force play the failure cutscene. So I have to figure out a way to basically say, okay, if I do go below zero, then I want you to play this. And if I don't go below zero, then I want you to play this. I didn't really want to have that be under the deal damage clip because it. It feels like I'm kind of piling on to the deal damage clip at that case or at that point, because um, it's not really relevant to have these death cut scenes when I could just you know deal damage. Um. <sighs> okay, how would I want to handle this? Well, um, there are a couple of approaches that I can think of. One would be for me to uh, have a to write a timeline script that will basically say. Okay, sample the player's current health, and if it's less than some arbitrary value, um, set the default failure cutscene on the uh, on the combat system to be this. Otherwise, play this cutscene, but that's really weird and sloppy, and it still doesn't account for the deal damage portion of it, which would of course override it, and you'd have two cutscenes playing at once. 
So, oh no, actually no, that, that one wouldn't, because uh, it would only play the second one if it was not going to fail. So, I guess that's the one that we would want to do then? Um, eh, alright. Let's, yeah, okay. So, I think I'm actually going to take this death cutscene out of this script, and instead I'm going to put it uh, in a new custom script that I write, which will be... I guess I could derive from deal damage clip and have one for the... No, it's okay. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. Get rid of this. Let's go to our behavior, go to definition. Uh, we're going to get rid of you and get rid of you. So I'm going to write a new script that will basically just ping the player's health and then do something cutscene-wise with it. And it's actually going to be funny because I will probably only have it play on behavior pause, not on behavior play, so that I can line it up with this stuff a little bit easier because I'm going to want it to play the cutscene at the end of this cutscene, not at the beginning of the clip. So that's going to be a little esoteric. Uh, let's go ahead and close you, close you, and... Yes, time like cutscenes is what I would want to do here. Okay, I have the hiccups. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and say right click, create folder, and we're gonna say, <laughs> God, what do I want to call it? Like HP based cutscene. Uh, how about post damage cutscene? That's actually not a bad name. Uh, so we're going to make a new playable, playable behavior. We're going to call this post damage cutscene behavior. Yeah, that seems right. How about play post cutscene damage? Ah, eh, whatever. Post damage cutscene behavior is fine, I think. Okay, we're going to create a new playable asset. Post damage cutscene clip. Okay, let's open you up. Open you both up. Can I get to both of you? Haha, -ha, I can. This is going to be textquest.combat. Here, uh, we don't need, let's see, so we're going to have a public playable director, no, playable director. Uh, I guess this will be death cutscene and non-death cutscene. Public playable director, non lack of a better term. Uh, and for this, we're going to get rid of on graph start and stop. We do need on behavior play, but only for a very, very stupid reason. Private pool is playing false. It's only so that I can make sure that I'm actually playing. If application is playing, is playing is equal if application not is plain and it is plain, oh, not iOS it is plain plain is equal to false okay and then we're just going to say oh you know what actually on behavior play I do want to do something which is just going to be oh I need the combat system okay so we're going to come up here we're going to say public Combat system, combat system, okay. And we're just going to say if combat system, no, come on. Combat system.
dot player player HP uh, is less than or equal to a arbitrary value. I'm going to say zero there for now, but I'm probably actually going to come up here. We're going to say public, uh, not a float, it's an int, right? Yeah, public int. Uh, I'll say HP threshold is equal to zero by default. Um, and we'll just say if it's less than or equal to our HP threshold, then we're going to say combat system dot what are my cutscene failure cutscene is equal to death cutscene I guess. And then we will have down here, we're just going to say if pretty much the exact same thing, but in reverse. So we're just going to copy you, grab you, and we're just going to say if it's greater than the HP threshold, greater than or equal to the HP threshold, I guess, uh, then we are going to, you know what, actually, I guess that should be less than our HP threshold. No. Actually, no, that's not true. Because um, I'm basically trying to f frame this in such a way that our damage is technically on a different clip, which means that it could be done while this clip is in play, which is a little awkward. I'm not sure if I like that. Um, I prefer them to be in the same block of code, but they're not, because uh, they're two separate things. Uh, we think for better frame, by the way. Uh, so all I'm going to do is instead of saying failure cutscene, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we're just going to call non-death cutscene dot play. Oh, we're not done yet. I actually need to come down here. So using sleepy hollow clock because I want this to be play from start. Okay. That should work. So let's go ahead and copy these. Come to our clip. <laughs> This paste everything in. Okay. And then we need to do exposed references for all time. Uh, so for this, we're just going to say behavior dot combat system is equal to combat system dot oh, come on put me in here combat system dot resolve uh, graph dot get resolver and then let's just copy and paste that three times and this is going to be death cutscene non death cutscene finally behavior dot Threshold is equal to HP threshold. Cool. So that should be all the code we need. I'm going to click off of that and then click back on them because they're going to do that stupid thing again that they always do, and it drives me nuts. I don't know why this happens at my computer at home, but it does not happen to my computer at work. And that's very annoying to me. Hmm. All right, so with all of that taken care of, now we should be able to actually set up a somewhat sensible cutscene uh, progression system, I guess. So let's let that compile. Okay, so we have our combat playable track, which is going to deal damage. Oh, which reminds me, I actually need to now go back to my combat playable track so that I can add this stuff. Um, so we're going to say track clip type dot type of and then uh, what is it post damage cutscene clip okay we'll let that go let that compile real quick and I'm gonna take a drink <laughs> I was right, by the way. 
from for my hesitation at the beginning when I'm like, surely we'll get through this this one animation. Nope. <laughs> uh too much too much that I do between animations. It's never as simple as I always think it's gonna be. Okay. Let's go ahead and add a new combat playable track. I'm gonna rename this to uh, deal damage. Then this is going to be Play or set cutscene, I guess. Set next cutscene. That, that's a little vague, but it works. So I'm just gonna like bump this up to an arbitrary distance of like there, ish. Uh, the main thing is I just want to make sure that it's bef it's done before deal damage. Okay, and with that we can actually reference stuff now. So if we don't die, then we can do that, and if we do die, then we'll do nothing for now. Our HP threshold is just going to be 1. Um, I should probably go ahead and tooltip that so that I don't forget what it does. Um, let's go ahead and say serialize field, tooltip, serialize field, grab new, paste and paste. Uh, we're going to give you guys private as well. private stuff. Okay. And it's going to be uh, if the player's HP is at or equal this value, we set the failure cutscene for the combat system. And actually, now that I think about it, uh, I need to go to post damage here, and if I don't have one set, then I don't want to set the failure cutscene. So I'm going to say uh, if failure, I'm sorry, death cutscene. Death cutscene does not equal null like that. Okay. Because there are situations where I won't want to actually override the, failure, the default failure cutscene, uh, and I'll want it to just play out like normal but I need to be able to change them as well, should I choose to do so. Okay, let that compile. All right. And then we'll probably turn off preview and get my super dramatic camera angle. God, I'm so happy about those Dutch angles. Uh, okay. So this is our current cutscene. We're pretty happy with that. We have our post damage. We're not going to worry about anything else. Okay, we're good, we're good. Now we can start on our next cutscene. Um, so to start, we are going to need to do a couple of things. Um, we're going to need a Cinemachine timeline, Cinemachine track, which is going to be, I believe, our segment one cam camera to start, which of course I because that's going to be what our default camera is. Cinemachine Brain is our main camera, of course. Uh, this is going to last probably... You know, I actually don't even know if it's going to move. Um, because the idea is that it's just going to, like, you're going to drop dead there. Oh, wait, no, this is the continued failure, so I, li I lied. Um, this is not the one where you die. Uh, for that, yeah, we will definitely have a second Cinemachine shot clip, which will eventually transition back to our intro uh, idle. Uh, we are going to want that to probably, let's see, uh, we're going to need two seconds for the roll animation, and then we're going to need probably about five seconds for rolling back. So that's seven. Let's go ahead and make this seven plus two for, well, no, let's make this ten. Yeah, no, 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 let's make it eight. And then I'm going to move this, and probably we'll make this ten again. And I'm going to make you uh, 8, and we'll have you start at 5. So we'll have a pretty long transition from camera to camera, but that's kind of what I want. Because basically what I, what I want to have happen is, uh, as you start rolling back this way, I want the camera to transition to the side so that we can see the pop and all of that, make everything look nice. Okay. 
So that's our camera setup. Let's go ahead and add a combat playable track. We're going to need to add set cinemachine clip because otherwise it's going to lose what camera it should be set to. We're looking good there. All right. From here, we're going to add an animation track because I know we're going to need one. And, oh, I should add a track subgroup, which is going to be for our hero. We're also going to add a track subgroup for our troll. Okay. Track our hero over here. Uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to move the hero parent over to there. And from there, I'm also going to go ahead and add a set animator parameter track, which is going to be on our, not our troll, on our hero. That. Set animator parameter. Ah, okay, I'm getting tired of this. I don't want to keep entering strings here, so I'm going to gonna actually cheat. Uh, let's see, what are you? Animator parameter info. We're going to be adjusting our animator parameter info class. Go to the operation. Uh, so, okay. Um, <laughs> I might not have that actually. Hold on. Let's go ahead and let that compile. Um, asset reference car. Let's go ahead and see where your parent find all references. No, I did not. I'm not doing anything. Okay, well, I'm going to write a new uh, editor script real quick. <coughs> Excuse me. So we're going to add under attributes, no, under animation. Uh, it's not going to be animator parameter info. Instead, it's going to be interesting. Do you have a hash? Why am I using you? It's like, this is partially what I want. Um, oh, I know why I have that hash. Okay, yeah. So I'm actually going to change this up a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to make this be an animator. Uh, for now, it looks like none of my scripts are actually using this, which is good. Uh, I'm going to change this to, oh, yes. This is going to be so much fun. <sighs> well, this is a good thing to end on. So um, we're going to be doing some runtime animator controller conversion, which is actually just going to be, yeah, runtime animator controller conversion. So this is going to be fun for everyone involved. Um, so this is going to be an animator controller. I'm sorry, it's going to be runtime animator controller. Okay. Uh, we're going to rename this to our controller. And let's see, we have our parameter and our parameter hash. That's all good. Now, actually, that's not quite right, because what we want to say is, oh boy, oh boy, yeah, this is going to be fun. Uh, no, 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 that, that's correct. Okay, uh, so let's go to find all references, come over here. Uh, this is actually going to be uh, of time, or it's going to derive from asset reference drawer. Close you and <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be fun. Oh, jeez, all kinds of crap. Oh boy. Yep, we're gonna have fun with this. Okay, um, so I'm gonna just basically get rid of all of this. None of this is what I need. Um, so I'm, I'm actually just going to start from scratch pretty much. Which probably means, actually, you know what, let's uh, go ahead and save that. I'm not going to change anything. Let's undo this. I'm just going to... Ah, jeez. No, no, because I, I do want to just extend this. I'm just going to start from scratch, though. 
the runtime animator controller parameter uh, parameter hash. I can probably go ahead and also give this a public. Yeah, well, let's not do that first. Come down here. We're gonna say public animator parameter type. so I can get information about it. Uh, let's see. Why are these public when they're just the actual thing? Who knows? What are we doing here? Yeah, we aren't doing anything. So why am... whatever. So let's go ahead and set that. Come over here. And now begins the fun part. Um, so I am going to go ahead and just comment all of this out for now. Um, we're essentially going to just start the thing off in. Come down here. All right. So it's now a property drawer. It's no longer a custom editor. So I don't, I can't cache values because that can sometimes lead to weird um, cache behavior between uh, fields that are using it. So instead, I have to do everything in OnGUI. Um, but I don't really actually have to do much in OnGUI because I'm already deriving from asset reference drawer, which takes care of like two thirds of what I, I need to do. So I need to override. Uh, Asset field. Let's go ahead and come over here. And then I need to override target field. And by default, these are, these are just strings. Uh, by default, I believe target field is a yeah, parameter, which is not what we want. So we want this to instead be ID, right? Or parameter. Or, hmm. Actually, let's go ahead and just make it name, I guess, and then hash. OK, so we're going to say name. Uh, and we will also have an asset, or we'll have the animator. Uh, this is going to be the controller. Controller. Let's go ahead and grab that. Save, come over here. I hit Control C. Yep, I did. Ooh. Okay, so now our default asset reference drawer should actually show that field. Uh, so to give you a sense of that, let's go ahead and is it going to be? No, that should be fine. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me see. Asset reference drawer and render parameter info setting. But okay, uh, I'm just going to be lazy here, and I'm just going to add a public animator parameter. Ram. It's a new another parameter. Okay. I'll let that compile and I'll show you what the difference there is. So this is what the default field looks like. It's basically just a string field. Uh, and I don't want to work with animators directly because they have really odd things that they do whenever you save the scene. They seem to like lose reference of what clips they have, so they're not actually as useful as you would think because they constantly get blown away. Um, but actually referencing the animator controller is a more reliable way of grabbing that information. So instead, if I were to go ahead and let's see, what actually is my another hero controller? Uh, hero mirror down here is what I want. Now, if I give it this, it's going to give me my name field. Oh, that's interesting. Why are you even using that? OK. That's weird. Whatever. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to change that real quick. Let's go to Asset Reference Drawer. I'm going to say override, let's see, draw target field, that's what I want. I'm going to go to base, not draw target field, go to definition. Uh, and we are not going to give it, I guess we can give it its, its label. It's weird when we do that, but fine. Uh, it's meant to be overridden anyway. So we're not going to actually call base, because all that does is draw the default field. Instead, we want to draw a custom field, which is going to be our pop-up. And this is where it gets fun. Uh, so we're going to need to say, 
the asset property is the asset that we're referencing, which in this case is our animation controller. And I'm actually going to need to come up here and say using Unity Editor dot animation not animated values animations. Okay, and let's see if I can remember how to do this properly. Um, we're going to say runtime animator controller controller is equal to asset property oops, asset property dot get object reference runtime animator controller okay now the reason that we have to use runtime animator controller is because that's what is actually available at runtime uh, we can't use the editor stuff because it would throw errors if we did that so instead we're going to say uh, let's see I think it's animation utility dot let's see if we can get this there should be a way of grabbing the edit let's see get animated objects curve bindings I don't need the curve binding it's a completely different thing uh, da, 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 float value key broken reference curve no that's not it there should be a way to retrieve so let's say unity dot animations dot where are my options here uh, we need to basically get an animator controller that's what we're after but to do so there should be an actual class that we call to convert our runtime animator controller to its uh, edit mode controller is that clean uh, let's see destroy immediate State machine animator instantiator set animator controller. No, that's not it. Uh, controller dot clean. No. Dang it! I can't remember what what this is off the top of my head. Uh, hold on. Uh, da -da -da -da. Should be a way to do this. Oh right, that's that's what it is. Uh, I forgot how roundabout it is. Um, so essentially, we have to load the actual asset at the path that the runtime controller exists exists at. That's what it is. So we can basically just do this, this, and then we'll say asset data base.load asset at path uh, animator controller and then give it the <laughs> asset database dot get asset path from that object okay and that should give us our controller and from that we can actually get our parameters Heading out. All right, I'll see you later, Gelmega. Good luck getting reflection to work. So we're going to say controller.parameters, and from there we can actually do stuff. <laughs> so, uh, what we're going to want to do is say controller.parameters, which is uh, animator controller parameter. So we're going to say animator controller parameter array params is equal to that. Okay. Oh, and parameters, not parameter. And then all we're going to do there, after that, we need to say, um, not, yeah, probably GUI content. So GUI content uh, names is equal to new GUI content param, parameters dot length. Okay. And then we're going to loop through that for int i equals zero. i is less than names dot length i plus plus names of i is equal to new GUI content and i do need it to be a GUI content because i believe the pop-up is going to be a little bit more complicated which means we want GUI content stuff otherwise the strings get super touchy um, and this is just going to be based off of the parameters of i dot name okay 
And from there, we're just going to come down here. We're going to need to do an int index check. So we're going to say int index is equal to negative 1. I set it to negative 1 because if I set it to 0, it's possible that it wouldn't actually detect a weird behavior. So um, what I do is I set it to negative 1, and then we loop through all of our uh, names. So for int i equals 0. Actually, you know what? I can actually do this at once. I'm going to move this up above it. So I'm going to move this to here. And then I'm going to say if, okay, apparently I spelled this wrong. If uh, names of i is equal to property dot string value, uh, then we will, oh, right, sorry. Wait, what? Oh, sorry. Right. Dot text is equal to property dot string value, uh, then we're going to say index is equal to uh, i. And for this, we're going to say if i is greater than, I'm sorry, no, if i is less than 0, and this, because we only want to do that once. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say if i is less than 0, so, okay, all kinds of weird there, index if that's the case, then it means that we did not have an, a current value, which means that, you know, like the property, the property was removed or something. So we want to reset our index value back to zero. So we're going to say uh, index is equal to zero, at which point we will set um, our uh, property dot string value is equal to names. Also, I'm going to have to say Uh, what? Of course, dot text. I keep forgetting that. Um, also, we're going to have to say property dot get sibling property, which is going to be called hash, uh, and that dot int value is going to be equal to parameters of i or of index dot name hash, I believe. Yes, that's what we want because uh, in animators the hash int value is a more performant way of actually triggering animation. So we want to be able to access both of those, the name for clarity, and then the hash value for uh, performance. So I store both of those. And then I also store the type, which is going to be uh, property dot get sibling property uh, type dot int value is equal to uh, parameters of index dot type, and then we're going to just convert that to an int. Okay. I'm pretty sure that those match up, but just to be sure. All right, uh, so that sets all of our default values in case something is wrong. And then after that, we're going to need to do a GUI ch or a change check, and then we should be good. So we're just going to say editor GUI dot begin change check. And then if editor GUI dot end change check. I can't spell. End change check. Oh my god. There. Otherwise, we're going to say index is equal to editor GUI layout. Boop, 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 not, not layout. GUI dot. It's not property field either. Dot pop up. And then we will give it a position. We will give it a label. Uh, so we're going to say. Oh no, I don't want a label because I don't. I don't actually want that to show up. Taking off. All right. Sounds good. I think I'm probably going to call it quits after I finish this script up in a little bit. Lunchtime. You're only four hours behind. It's dinner time. Or I guess three hours behind. Uh, then we're going to give this our, let's see, what is it? I think we need our index and then our options. Yep. So we're going to say index followed by names. Okay. And then we're pretty much just going to do this. Okay. So. 
let's go ahead and let that compile. And now we should have a super fancy uh, selectable editor here. to compiles. We'll have a super fancy editor. Any day now. All right, there we are. And ta-da! Oh, I did something wrong. Interesting. What did I do? <laughs> interesting, interesting, interesting. Am I not setting the index properly? Index is equal to zero if we're less than zero. Or is it going to send it to five? No, that's correct. Index is equal to five because it's content, so that's an option. Um, hmm. Interesting. I am not sure what's happening here. Uh, obviously, our string value is not being set, which add. Uh, Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. I bet I overlooked something. Uh, I bet it's something stupid too. Pop up. If squeeze. And then change check. And then afterwards, string value is equal to names of type. Hmm. Why would you? I guess I could uh, buzz.log property.path just to make sure that that's correct. And then after the fact, let's just debug that. So buzz.log property.string value. It should work. Because it's phi is less than zero, which it oh, oh that's why. Because I said i is less than zero, not index less than zero. Of course, it's something stupid. It's always something stupid with me. Okay, that should actually do it. once it decides to compile. Hmm. I miss the side projects already just because they compile in like one second. <laughs> Technically, I think they compile in like 20 milliseconds, which is as fast as basically we can see instant movement. So there we go. So now I can easily uh, select those and I would show you the types and all that by debugging, except we're in a in a clip, which won't let us do that. So, uh, but yeah, that actually does seem to work, and that is now a much more uh, usable drop-down method. So I can change this ID from a string field to this essentially, and it will do the same thing, except much more conveniently. So let's go ahead and well. Uh, I think we'll call that a day, actually, because I can take care of that stuff. It's going to be pretty tedious stuff. Uh, but, yeah, it's a pretty good place to stop for the night. So we got pretty far in. Uh, we have the initial failure uh, cutscene done. Well, yeah, it's, I believe it's done. Uh, we're moving on to the second part of that initial cutscene, um, the continued failure. 
and then we will of course have to uh, support you know dying there and that's going to be really fun for all the combat systems it's going to god there's so much animation that has to be done for these things um which is a bit of my own making obviously <laughs> but it will certainly be much more enjoyable to see you know your character run into a bar than die um, than it would be to see them run into a bar roll into a ball f roll back jump into the air land and then just drop dead for no reason Okay, that's a pretty good place to stop for the night, so as always, I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you all next time.